Zig, your seminars and your audio tapes stress the importance of helping other people. Explain that concept to me. Well, basically it's built around the idea that you can have everything in life you want if you'll just help enough other people get what they want. Sam Walton put it this way, I enriched myself because I enriched so many other people. Excellent. Has your definition of success changed over the years? And how about society overall? They have one definition of success. Can you equate any of that? Well, there's a lot of confusion between success and fame, and I think Irma Bonbeck uh, summed it up extraordinarily well when she said, Madonna has one and Mother Teresa has the other. My own evaluation and concept of success has not varied over the years. There are eight things that everybody wants. That's to be happy and healthy and wealthy. That includes money. You see, wealth is what you have when the money's gone. They want to be secure, they want to have friends, they want to have peace of mind, good family relationships, and hope for the future. That's the total perspective of what everyone wants. Acquiring it requires considerable effort and a number of success qualities to get there. While we're on that, let's, let's analyze some of those success qualities. Well, it begins with integrity because without integrity, people won't listen and without trust, no one follows. I thought Schwarzkopf uh, in his uh, interview summed it up extraordinarily well when he was asked what is leadership. He said it's competence, more importantly, it's character, it's taking action, it's doing what's right. Those are qualities that will make a difference. If there was one outstanding quality of success, in your opinion, what would it be? I don't believe there can be one outstanding quality. For example, you can have all of the good qualities, but if you don't have courage to take action, then nothing is going to happen. You can be intellectually bright and have a magnificent plan, but if you don't have communication skills to deliver them, then you're not going to be effective. So there are a series of qualities. Interestingly enough, 91% of the CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies, according to the April 28, 1986 issue of Fortune magazine, learned their values and their morals out of the Bible and in church. So those sound values, ethical, moral, religious values, uh, definitely will form the base for any truly outstanding success. And you would say that the same case in your personal life? Absolutely. Uh, another study by Corn Ferry International in conjunction with the UCLA School of Management revealed that 89% of the vice presidents of 1,361 large corporations uh, were either Catholic, Jewish, or Protestant, and apparently were active in their faith. By the same percentage, uh, they were all still married to their one and only mate, and 92% of them were raised by two parent families. So the family plays a significant role. Giving our society today the breakdown of, of the family and religious values, do you think that is some of the answer to our problems? Oh, very definitely, it specifically is the answer. And to kind of document that, uh, in 1776, three million Americans produced Jefferson and Franklin and Hamilton and Adams and Monroe and Madison. And in 1992, 250 million Americans produced, and you'll have to fill in the names, you see. Thomas Jefferson Research Institute says that in 1776, over 90% of the teaching and training, most of which was done at home and in church, was of an ethical, religious, moral nature. By 1926, the percentage had fallen to 6%, and by 1951, the percentage was so low you could not measure it. I believe that's being reflected in our society today. And to help change that would be to bring back those values? Yes, indeed. Now, I'm not talking about necessarily talking about religion in schools, but I am talking about values. Uh, Japan, for example, is the least Bible reading nation on earth, but from kindergarten, uh, one hour a day until they graduate from high school, they have a course which teaches them the values of honesty, character and integrity, hard work, enthusiasm, positive thinking, thrift, respect for authority, 
the things that really are values that will make a difference. How much of success is self-effort, luck, and or divine intervention? <laughs> Steve, I, uh, I heard somebody say, you know, they noticed that the harder they worked, the luckier they got. It requires a considerable amount of self-effort, but it also requires the confidence that goes with that, coupled with the training, you know. Positive thinking alone won't work. Just this evening, I was writing about an experience I had as a seventh grader. I was uh, kind of a schoolyard uh, gladiator in the seventh grade, I went out for the boxing team. I weighed all of 82 and a half pounds. The kid closest to my size was little Joe Stringer. He weighed 63 pounds. I knew I was gonna kill him. We got in the ring, but he had been on the boxing team two years. <laughs> I'll tell you, before the first round was over, my nose was so sore, I couldn't believe it. Now, I was confident. I was enthusiastic. I was willing, but I was also getting killed. All of that to say, you gotta have the right attitude but you've also got to have the right training. Training, and could that also equate to strengths and weaknesses, natural strengths? Yes, you have natural strengths, and you certainly want to play on those. But I think one of the things that we need to constantly emphasize is we need to teach our people, our society, our country, that failure is an event. It's not a person. Yesterday ended last night. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. I think in terms of uh, the Atlanta Braves baseball team, uh, your top hitter scarcely hit uh, 300. Now he makes several million dollars a year to do that. Now let me emphasize something. When he steps up to the plate, he's not thinking about the fact that seven times out of 10, he does not get a hit. He doesn't consider himself a failure. Your self-talk doesn't include you're a bum, you're sorry, you're no good. It's saying, man, I didn't get there last time, but boy, let me at him this time. That attitude is what I'm talking about. That's what I mean when I say failure is an event, it's not a person. That's what we need to understand. So that's how we can handle our defeats that do come. Absolutely, absolutely. What characteristics in individuals do you admire, do you personally admire? I have several people. Uh, I have a mentor. His name is Fred Smith. He's 76 years old. He went with UNESCO when there were 80 people. When he left, there were over 80,000. Uh, he's been a consultant for a number of major companies, served on the board for Mobile Oil. He's truly one of the wisest men I have ever known. We visit regularly, and I never see him that I do not uh, carry a notepad with me, literally because I take so many notes, I have so many questions to ask. His wisdom is so incredible. He's well-educated, but there's a difference in knowledge and information and wisdom. You get uh, information out of newspapers and magazines. You get knowledge out of good books and encyclopedias. But until you add the spiritual dimension, uh, you're missing the wisdom, or some people prefer to call it common sense. That's the reason some public figures who are geniuses in one department really drop the ball in so many other departments because their common sense or wisdom is missing. That's what I admire about Fred Smith so much. He has such great balance of all of those things. Would you say that that would be a, a, a key point for an individual to find themselves a mentor or an older gentleman perhaps to mentor someone else? Yes, uh, that's tremendously helpful. Those are not always available. That's the reason good books and growth is so incredibly important. Simple story, Vince Robert, Ottawa, Canada, 37 years old, taxi driver, fifth grade education realized he was going nowhere, bought himself a big dictionary, put it on the front seat of his cab, started on page one, word one, started learning those words. Before he got a half inch in it, he was understanding things he had never understood before. Started investing in the stock market, ended up buying the 19 car cab company, kept on investing. Today is a wealthy man, travels Canada, uh, telling other people how he did it. He's a self-educated man. So it can happen 
even on your own. Absolutely. We need to explain to people, Steve, there's a difference in uh, school and education. So you can finish school, you can even make it easy. That's not true with education. Uh, you never finish it, and it's seldom easy. For example, I was a poor student when I was in school. I tell people I was in that part of the class that made the top half possible. But in the uh, last 20 years, I've become an excellent student. I read and research an average of three hours a day and have for the last 20 years. So you can acquire that education, uh, you know, if a person really wants it. Schools today are not what they were five, 10 years ago. There's more distraction and temptations. With that in mind, how can parents help their students, their children, become better students and better individuals? Well, first of all, they need to accept the responsibility of what they have to do at home as far as getting that child ready for school. For example, a study in Missouri revealed that 60 to 65 percent of a child's working vocabulary is acquired by the age of three. So we need to start teaching the right voca <coughs> vocabulary early. Uh, second, 80% of the characters formed by the age of five and 90% of the personality by age seven. So those early years are critical. Then the parent needs to understand that they've got to work in cooperation with the teacher. Not say to the teacher, educate my child, but say, let's educate this child. I can give you a number of studies. The Scientific American, February 1992 issue, for example, gave a comprehensive study on Cambodians, uh, Japanese who came here right after World War II when prejudice was high, Jews, and Afro-Americans. And in every case across the board where parents were involved in reading to the child and taking an interest in the child and cooperating with the school officials, the teachers and educators, results across the board were the same. They were dramatic. They were marvelous. That's the key. Teamwork. Teamwork, absolutely. Do you personally have any uh, unmet goals in your life? You bet. Uh, I know most people think I'm in my early 30s, but actually I'm uh, 65. And on my 65th birthday, uh, I set one new goal. Personally, I'm a golf nut. I, I love to hit golf balls. I want to play the top 100 uh, golf courses in America before I cash them in and shoot my age at least one time. That's uh, one of my goals. Uh, I have uh, so many goals right now, Steve, as a writer, speaker, and so forth. If I don't have another idea, not another one, my next five years are already booked solid. I'm more excited about the future than I've ever been in my life. I was going to ask, don't you want to slow down here a little bit? I had more engagements this year than I've had any year since 1980. Now, I had too many because I haven't had enough time to do as much writing as I need to do. So I've slowed it down about 40% for next year, but I'll spend fully as many hours doing what I do. I'm just changing directions. How important are goals in our lives and, and how do we go about setting them? David Jensen at UCLA just finished a study on the people who attend my four hour seminars and here's what he discovered. Those who set their goals as a result of the seminar and followed through earned an average of $7,401 a month. Those who heard the same information but did not set their goals with a plan for reaching them earned an average of $3,397 a month. Now that's documented. But the other interesting part of it he discovered that people with goals have better family relationships and enjoy better health. People with direction just do better in every area of life. Explain to me why those, those half the people or whatever percentage it was that were at your seminar didn't set goals. Even though they heard it, perhaps they intelligently said, yes, and I need to have goals. How come they didn't set it? Steve, if I had the answer to that one, uh, I'd be sitting in the Oval Office. You're talking about human nature. So many people you see, and here's a very specific answer to that. So many people for so long have been told so many times what they cannot do. They really don't know what they can do. They have no idea what they want because they don't know what's available for them. And that's the key for them. They can see where you are 
anybody else could get it, but not me. The image they have of themselves, the picture they have of themselves is not that of a winner. And until we can persuade them to change the picture and show them how to change that picture, they're not going to set those goals because they say in their own mind, I can't get them anyhow. What's the use? That's the problem there. Are those people the unreachable or is it just a different way of reaching them that is difficult to accomplish? Well, Steve, is, uh, you probably know I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm the kind of guy that put a dime in the parking meter while his wife goes shopping. So I don't believe that they are unreachable. I believe simply that it takes a little longer and we'll have to take a different approach. We'll have to talk about the entire person. My friend and mentor Fred Smith says, we've got to teach these people that success comes in clusters meaning simply that you do not ignore one phase of life while you concentrate on the other. You can't say when I'm 40 years old, I'll be successful, then I'll start paying attention to my children who by then are 19 years old. You, you gotta move up with a balanced perspective. And uh, that's the way you reach a lot of these people. They think if you reach this, you gotta give up that. And that simply is not true. So you're talking about a, a balanced, goal setting for all areas of your life. Absolutely. Only 3% of the people in our society have a complete goals program, meaning they set physical, mental, and spiritual goals. They set social, family, career, and financial goals. Uh, everybody has goals. Uh, you know, a heroin addict has a goal of getting another fix. A bank robber might have a goal of robbing another bank. But I mean where you spread it out so you really are looking at all of life so that you are a completely successful person. And that person has to be a complete person before they perceive of themselves as being a completely successful person. Question with that, and I've listened to your tapes and read your books, how do you, how do you balance all that? You know, if I'm working on a, a career goal, it takes almost all my effort to make that happen. There's no time left for personal social or spiritual, whatever it might be. How, how do you get a good balance on working on five goals in one day? Well, the reality is, and our formula includes working on only four goals uh, on any given day. Now, we might have 25 goals that we will hit once a week or once a month or whatever, but that which is important are the things which you will do. And what you got to do is prioritize let me tell you what I do with my audiences on every seminar. I start by asking how many of you are honest and every hand goes up. Second question, how many of you, the day before you go on vacation, generally get more done than you normally get done in any two, three, four, or five days? Well, everybody holds up their hand. Of course I do, all right? Then let me tell you why you do that. First of all, you focus on exactly what you've got to do. Second, you make a list of what needs to be done. Third, you prioritize those things as to what is important. Fourth, you get after them with a considerable amount of enthusiasm. Fifth, you accept the responsibility that if you don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. Sixth, you make the commitment to do it. And seventh, you become a team player. Now, if it works that well before you go on vacation, why not do it every day? Now let me emphasize a point. By doing it every day, one of two things will happen. You'll either move up the ladder very quickly or else you will finish what you need to do much more quickly. Then you can use the extra time for recreation, personal growth, family time, spiritual goals, or all of the other things. Lack of time is not the problem. Lack of direction is the problem. Wouldn't that cause high anxiety, trying, trying to do too much and short period of time and then driving yourself every day to do that? Uh, if you only had the goal of doing as much as you could every day on the job, it possibly could and you would end up being a workaholic instead of a peak performer. But if you will, uh, re remember just a moment ago I said you can then take that extra time and do all of the other things. Personal example. When I'm on the road, I'm a total and complete workaholic. When I sit down on that airplane, as a matter of fact, on the way to the airport, I am generally either listening to information 
or I am dictating letters or dictating a book I'm writing. When I get on the airplane, I either write or read the entire time. I got here tonight, I had 15 minutes before I needed to start getting dressed. I dictated a couple of stories that will show up in the next book. I will work every moment I'm here. Now, when I get back home, that's a totally different matter. I work a very normal schedule. For example, this morning, uh, the redhead and I, as you know, I call my wife the redhead at her request. Uh, we spent a little over an hour at breakfast. Uh, we spent a full hour at lunch, and we talked probably before I made my departure at a uh, quarter of one. Uh, we probably talked an additional hour. Now, I'd started my day at 5.20 this morning. I wake up early, so I had uh, worked a full two hours before she got up, but that didn't interfere with my time with her when she got up. Do we need dreams? Without dreams. And what's the difference between dreams and making it happen? Well, dreams are absolutely critical uh, if we're really going to be successful in life. The only uh, difference is you dream with your eyes wide open and not uh, while you're sound asleep only. The difference between a dream and a goal is simply a goal is a dream with a deadline. So we need to have that vision and that dream, and then we need to start going through the process, the formula of working towards reaching it. For example, uh, my dream of doing what I'm doing today as a speaker was born in 1952. It was 1968 before I was able to get into it on a full-time basis. For 16 years, I prepared, and in the preparation time, during that period of time, I supported my family as a salesperson, but I was doing a tremendous amount of reading, speaking to anybody and everybody in the meantime who would let me speak. I was fulfilling my responsibilities in one career while preparing for the other. What is your personal secret for a happy life? Well, from my personal perspective, uh, Steve, uh, I'm a born-again Christian. My faith is extraordinarily strong. It means a great deal to me. When the question of eternity was resolved, that meant all I had to be concerned about was today. And I can concentrate on today very easily. I don't have any difficulty with that. I'm reasonably well organized. I'm a very hard worker when I'm working. When I play, though, I, uh, when I go to the golf course, for example, I don't want anybody talking business to me. I'm out there completely to relax. When I'm with my family, uh, I'm strictly with my family. I, compart uh, you know, I put it in compartments. Basic problem a lot of people have is when they're on their job, they're thinking about their family. When they're with their family, they're thinking about their job and they're not as effective in either place as they otherwise would be. I focus, and that's one of the reasons I've been able to accomplish a lot of the objectives I've been able to accomplish. Level with us, do you ever get depressed or get down? <laughs> that's the favorite question people ask the redhead, uh, you know, and uh, she'll tell you that the only time I'm ever less than enthusiastic is when I'm extremely tired. Uh, I refuse to have imported interviews or make significant decisions when I'm very tired because I realize that I'm not at my sharpest best. I really don't get uh, de depressed. Uh, you know, I'm not always on cloud 87, uh, but I'm generally pretty upbeat. And if I have a, something that I must do, I don't have any trouble at all getting emotionally prepared for it. If you could only read three books or have three books, which three books would they be? Oh, I'm not certain I can answer that question. Obviously, the Bible would be uh, the beginning one. I think in terms of what books meant to me, the power of positive thinking uh, came into my life at a very critical point and had a dramatic impact on my life. And so I would, uh, I would say that was a very important book. Another book that uh, had great impact on my life was written by 
a good Atlanta man, uh, Dr. David Schwartz, it was the magic of thinking big. He expanded my horizons as to what uh, could be done uh, with my life. My mentor, Fred Smith, in his book, uh, Learning to Lead, had a significant uh, impact on my life. Dr. John Maxwell from San Diego, California, has written uh, a couple of books that uh, have been very significant. Charlie Wiedemeyer from uh, Las Gatos, California, the man who has Lou Gehrig's disease, has just written a book entitled Charlie's Victory. I don't believe anybody alive can read that book and not be inspired and grateful and commit themselves to do more with what they've got. If you could, give me a, your short definition of each of these words of success. Success is doing what you really enjoy doing that has a definite objective that will benefit those other than yourself. Does it, does it benefit yourself as well, or is it only one-sided? Uh, it's got to benefit you. If it does not, then you'll soon lose interest in it. There's got to be a feedback or payback, otherwise you grow discouraged and quit. Your definition of persistence. It simply is hanging in there until the objective you have established for yourself has been reached. That possibly is one of my two or three strongest qualities. Motivation, definition of motivation. To motivate uh, literally means to pull out or to draw out that which is on the inside. People frequently ask me, how'd you like this book or that set of tapes? I say, well, let me tell you what I got out of them first, but more importantly, let me tell you what that book got out of me. I'm uh, currently reading a book uh, uh, written by uh, Ms. Kelly, I forget her first name, her middle name is Harrington, and I don't know why I've dropped it, but she has an approach to discipline that uh, is absolutely beautiful. It's getting a lot out of me. It's forcing me to think and draw other thoughts and ideas I've had over the years. So all of that to say to motivate is to pull out or to draw out that which is on the inside. Explain to me the difference between external motivation and internal motivation. See, even a lot of people uh, talk about that. They say all motivation is self-motivation. My response to that always is, why is it then that people will come to one of my seminars uh, discouraged and deflated and they go out and break records on occasion when they leave? An external force acted on them. You've got to make the decision to use that which is there. Uh, I think they're companions, they go together. A lot of times you've got to have the external motivation in order for the internal motivation to get in gear. But a lot of it boils down to want to. How badly do you want to? Uh, so that would equate to internal motivation as being probably the strongest of the two. Yes, but it's kind of like, uh, you know, you can take a small match and light a forest fire. So that external motivation then uh, becomes the ignition point. Motivation has been called the fire that lights the log of knowledge. And I believe that's a good definition of it. Explain to me your definition of a positive thinking. Positive thinking is an optimistic hope, not necessarily based on any facts that you can move mountains. And I've seen positive thinking move some mountains, but I've seen people get killed by it as well. Positive believing is the same optimistic hope, but this time based on a reason for believing that you can move those mountains. If I were to say that I could whip George Foreman, for example, that would be not positive thinking, that'd be idiotic thinking. Because I, you know, I obviously couldn't. But if Evander Holyfield were to say, I believe I can whip George Foreman, that's positive believing because he's already done it. So the believer builds a foundation and has reasons for believing he can do something. He or she are the people that are far more likely to ultimately be very successful than is the wild-eyed enthusiast who says, man, with positive thinking, you can just do anything. That's crazy, that's just not available, that's not possible. Incidentally, positive thinking will let you do infinitely more than negative thinking will. It's just that it has a ceiling with it you cannot do 
anything. How important is a sense of humor? Well, it's necessary to maintain your sanity, among other things. It's necessary to build permanent relationships because whether it's parent and child or husband and wife or boss employee or whether it's associates in an organization, over a long period of time, there's going to be conflict. And if there's a sense of humor that's involved, so many things are resolved because of that sense of humor. You come across as more human. All of the research, uh, Roger Ailes wrote a significant article uh, on the subject, and he simply says that in the business world, a sense of humor is appreciated by those doing the hiring and those who are promoted and getting promotions. Everything else being equal, the person who has a sense of humor will get the job and get the promotion. Very important. Incidentally, uh, it's also healthy and less expensive. Uh, uh, we know that a good Bella life triggers the uh, release of endorphins, nature's painkiller in your system, uh, and so it's good for your health. And there's a recent scientific study that shows that if you have a tennis of the life and suppress it, it reverses itself, comes back inside, and spreads your hips. And as you know, obesity is widespread, so <laughs> it saves money to go ahead in life. You won't have to buy a new wardrobe. There you go, good. Are we as a society getting uh, lazy? Uh, and how can we be tougher on ourselves? And if we are tougher, what does that bring about? Well, when you say lazy, to begin with, I don't believe there's any such thing as a lazy person. I believe they're either sick or uninspired. They're sick, they ought to go to the doctor if they're uninspired. That's what this is really uh, all about. But the reality is we are raising our people to play instead of work. Example, typical 18-year-old has watched 17,000 hours of television, has listened to 11,000 hours of music, and watched 2,000 hours of the movie and TV. That doesn't include time they spend on the telephone, riding around, having dates, or going to athletic events. The emphasis is on play, play, play. Now you put 30,000 hours together, and in 30,000 hours you can finish kindergarten, grade school, middle school, high school, college, medical school, and serve your internship. So the emphasis has been on play, entertainment. I'm not opposed to a lot of entertainment, but 30,000 hours is ridiculous. For example, 10,000 hours, Steve, uh, devoted to a subject, and you can become an absolute authority on just about anything in the world. So parents and society, in cooperation with the media, needs to be stressing the fact that you're bored to death. Try working. That will relieve some of it. And the pleasure is getting uh, less... Uh, moral all the time, the thrust uh, more and more, like this latest thing on Madonna, which, as you know, was released by Times Warner. They only had four stipulations that she could not do, and they named two of them. Uh, number one, she could not be photographed having sex with an animal. And number two, uh, she could not uh, use a religious object to have sex with. When we reach that level, I think it's time for concern in our society. Absolutely. How powerful is our minds? You talk about that it's that it has a limit, but how powerful is it? We I hear reports we use only five, ten percent of our brain. How can we improve? Well, one thing is we need to use them more. In the uh, September-October issue of uh, Psychology Today in 1992, they were talking about the difference in the achievement math-wise of Chinese students as versus American students. And the discovery was this, the Chinese students do dramatically better, not because they're smarter, but because early on in their math, they do an awful lot of repetitions. They'll take the multiplication table and they go over it and over it and over it and over and over and over and over and over until it becomes totally automatic. Then when they get into the abstract things, because they've got the basics so completely a part of them, 
their creativity comes into being a lot more. And that's why they're doing so much better at math, as an example. So we use our mind, uh, we exercise those mind muscles, we let our creativity, uh, you know, really uh, generate there. But it takes work initially in order to do that. So we have to be tougher on ourselves. Absolutely. Discipline uh, is the great key. So many people uh, view discipline uh, as uh, a negative word, you know, oh, this is going to hurt, you know, I'm giving up this and that. One of the most positive words known to man is discipline. Think about it, you take the train off the track, uh, you know, it's absolutely free, but it can't go anywhere. Take the steering wheel out of the automobile, it's under the direction of no one, but it can't move. On the other hand, you take the sailor, he only has freedom of the seas when he disciplines himself to trust the compass. Now, until he trusts the compass, he's got to stay within sight of shore. But once he becomes obedient to that compass, listen, he can go anywhere in the world, the boat will take him. Man is that way. He needs to discipline himself to be his best self. Then he has the freedom to accomplish infinitely more objectives. Tell me your... Um favorite success story of an individual or a company, your best success, best example of success that you've seen? Two years ago, while speaking for the Department of Defense in uh, Colorado Springs, I heard a young speaker named John Foppy, who uh, was 19 years old, speaking also at the Department of Defense. John was born without arms. As a matter of fact, he had a number of significant difficulties. They gave him not even one chance in a hundred to live, and he had no hip sockets or anything. That young man stood up there with the poise and confidence like you just about can't believe. Over a period of time, I came to know John, was so impressed with him that for the first time in my career, I invited an outside speaker to join our staff. We normally raise our speakers up internally. To watch John Foppy uh, and to hear the story of how his mother particularly brought him along, uh, the things that she did when at age 10, and we've got a picture of John uh, drinking a glass of milk with his feet when he was two years old. At age 10, she refused to let the other boys in the family help him do anything. He had to completely do everything on his own. He drives his car, uh, he travels uh, by himself. Uh, to watch him uh, scramble an egg, for example, or put sugar in a cup of coffee with his feet, to watch him write and the way he handles the telephone and all of these other things. At age 10, he was having, as he said, a pity party one day. His mother didn't say a thing. She simply put a newspaper article in front of him for him to read. It was about a little girl who didn't have uh, any arms either, but neither did she have any legs. And John said that was the last time he really felt sorry for himself. What he's doing with his life is, in my mind, one of the greatest success stories I've ever seen. He speaks all over the country, youth groups, uh, uh, leadership groups, you name it. We had a young man named Samuel Akwasi Sarpong to come through our three-day seminar in Dallas. He was from the Ashanti tribe in the nation of Ghana. In his tribe, they named the babies based on the day of the week they're born. They have two other names, Samuel, first name, Sarpong, last name. Akwasi was his uh, Ashanti name. That means godly, gentle, peace-loving, and kind. The young man is a Christian minister. The baby is born on Wednesday named Kwaku. Now, Kwaku means mean, violent, aggressive, quick-tempered. Over 50% of all of the crime committed in the nation of Ghana is committed by those who are born on Wednesday. Now, sociologists say the only explanation is that an expectancy is set up as a result of the name. And the message I try to deliver is, how smart does it make a child to call them stupid? How much more productive does it make a worker to call them irresponsible and lazy? Words paint pictures, and then the mind goes to work to complete the picture.
I understand you're a big football fan. <laughs> Talk to me about that. Well, I'm really a Dallas Cowboy fan, uh, Steve. But, you know, I'm not, I don't know a lot about football, but I am a fan. I do know that in the NFL, in the last two minutes of the half, in the last two minutes of the game, they score over 20% of all of the points scored in those four minutes. That's three times as fast as they normally score. The reason they do is twofold. Number one, they plan to score, they prepare to score, and consequently they can expect to score. But incredibly enough, the other reason is the defense cooperates with them to help them score. They put in what they call the prevent defense. And as a result of it, everybody in the stands and everybody on the field keeps saying, don't let them score, don't let them score, don't let them score. Interesting fact. A few thousand years ago, a fellow named Job said that which I feared greatly has come to pass. Uh, a New York uh, psychologist will tell you in a New York minute, now New York minute is 32 seconds, uh, that your mind moves closest to the strongest picture. And so they're afraid they're going to score, the defense is, and that's what happens. You might remember the tragedy that took place in San Francisco about 10 years ago when the San Francisco 49ers beat the Dallas Cowboys. Now, they beat us in the last two minutes. We had the prevent defense out there. Dwight Clark made that immaculate reception. Okay, now, what I'm getting at is the reason we lost was explained by Tex Ram the next day in Dallas. Somebody asked him what happened. And he said, oh, it was very simple. The Dallas Cowboys went out there determined not to lose. The San Francisco 49ers went out there determined to win. The message I try to deliver to people is play to win. Don't play to avoid loss because the things you fear, the things that's going to happen to you. Set that target on something positive. Work for it. Expect it. Bobby Knight at Indiana University says the will to win is nothing without the will to prepare to win. See, everybody wants to win, but are you willing to prepare to win? One of the major points I often make is what you do off the job determines how far you go on the job. Every athlete, every actor, every singer, every entertainer knows that. Most doctors and attorneys and professionals know that. Specific example, in the typical American plant, the hourly wage earner watches 30 hours of TV a week. The person in charge of the line watches 25 hours of television a week. The foreman watches 20 hours a week. Plant superintendent watches 15 hours. The vice president watches between 12 and 15. The president watches between eight and 12, and the chairman of the board watches between four and eight hours of TV. And 50% of that time, he or she is watching training videos. Now, my question is, what would happen to that line worker who watches 30 hours a week if he were to take away 10 of those hours a week and study and plan and prepare? I guarantee you wouldn't stay on the line very long. What separates successful people from the rest of society? Well, I think a lot of times uh, pure persistence uh, makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about goals, setting goals. How do we go about doing that? We begin uh, by writing down everything we want to be, do, or have. Let it sit for 48 hours. Then after each thing we've written down, write one word, that's why. And if we can't articulate in one sentence why we want to be, do, or have, then we eliminate that one at that time as a goal because it's just an idle thought. It's nothing sincere or serious. How can we tell uh, what we're serious about? How, we, can, how can we really design something for our lives that's perhaps wishful thinking as opposed to reality? Well, actually, there are seven steps. You uh, look at what it is that remains on your list. And then you write down, number one, why do? You write the goal down, that's number one. Number two, why do I want to reach this goal? In other words, what will my benefits be if I reach this goal? Number three, you identify the obstacles that you'll have to overcome to get there. Number four, you spell out the people, the groups, the organizations you need to work with to get there. Number five, you identify what you need to know to get there. 
Number six, you devise a specific game plan to get there. And number seven, then you put the date on it. By the time you've done that, that will eliminate another 90% of all the things you've written <laughs> down. And that saves you enormous amounts of time. Filtration system. Absolutely. Right. How important is communication, uh, interpersonal relationships? It's enormously important. Uh, I can't overstate just how important it is because so many times what we think our mate, our workers, you know, really want, that's not what they want at all. A study was done and published by USA Today on what the manager's perception of what employees wanted was. And then they asked the employees, what do you want? And they were light years apart. And until you understand what people want, then uh, you're going to have difficulty. Classic example is U.S. and Japan. 1974 until 1990, uh, exports of American automobiles to Japan declined 2%. German exports of automobiles to Japan in the same time frame went up 700%. Reasons very simple. The Germans went to Japan discovered they built smaller cars and put the steering wheel on the right-hand side of the car. They'd been communicated with. They figured, hey, if we build smaller cars and put the steering wheel on the right-hand side, maybe they'll buy them. What Americans do, they kept building their big old cars and putting the steering wheels on the left-hand side. How many Japanese cars would be on American highways if they insisted on putting the steering wheel on the right-hand side? That's like a communication. That's not looking at your market. How can a person create a healthy self-image if perhaps they don't have a great opinion of themselves? Well, one thing they can start, my friend Joe Batten gave me this one. Uh, you list the victories you have had in your life. I mean, from the day that you can first remember, you'll be astonished to realize that a uh, typical 25-year-old uh, person can identify at least 200 things which they have done that have been successful, they've been victories. And then when things are not going well, they look at those and that gives them encouragement. Number two, identify the positive qualities which they have. In other words, anybody can honestly say, I can be just as honest as the next guy. I can work just as hard. I can be just as enthusiastic. I can develop just as much motivation. I can become just as good as student. And anybody with these qualities it's got to be you can accomplish that. that right. That's the way you dress it. even can have an impact on it. When life throws you a storm or some discipline in your life, how do you react? Most people don't like it. But actually, discipline in our lives can be a very positive force. As best-selling author and motivational speaker Zig Ziglar points out, without the discipline of a thorough safety check, a sailor could be going to sea in a leaky boat. You take the sailor, he only has freedom of the seas when he disciplines himself to trust the compass. Now, until he trusts the compass, he's got to stay within sight of shore. But once he becomes obedient to that compass, listen, he can go anywhere in the world, the boat will take him. Man is that way. He needs to discipline himself to be his best self. Then he has the freedom to accomplish infinitely more objectives. So what are some ways you can discipline yourself to experience the positive effects discipline brings? Number one, be tough on yourself. Expect more, but don't beat yourself up either. Number two, be consistent. Follow through with whatever you start. And number three, be accountable to someone else. A boat without a rudder drifts aimlessly. But with a rudder, the boat now has discipline and can be directed to sail the course. Could you achieve greater success in your life if you added a little discipline? 